for, all jo for joining us all today for the next installment of the Grenzenbach Clear and Associates webinar series, Leadership Annual Giving. Today's webinar is co-presented by Dan Lohman, Senior Vice President, GG&A Phil Philanthropic Analytics, and Kyle McGowan, Executive Director for Annual Giving of Vanderbilt University. Since joining the firm 11 years ago, Dan Lohman has served hundreds of client organizations. An award-winning public speaker, Dan's expertise includes prospect management, research, analytics, and prospect identification. Kyle McGowan is Executive Director for Annual Giving at Vanderbilt University, previously having been a Senior Director at Georgetown University, where he also received a Master's of Public Policy. Today's session will focus on the importance of leadership annual giving. We will begin it with a discussion of gap giving, its unique qualities, and its role in supporting a robust major gifts program. Kyle will discuss Vanderbilt University's experience in developing an unenhanced leadership giving program and its significance in Vanderbilt's camp current campaign. Finally, we will discuss the role of gift clubs and other stewardship strategies in strengthening the major gift pipeline. Our presenters welcome any questions you have during today's session and will answer those questions in the time remaining at the end of the hour. To address to address a question to Dan and Kyle, please use the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. Select all participants from the drop-down menu and send us your questions. Any questions we do not answer today will be addressed in a follow-up message we send next week. Tomorrow afternoon, we will send a recording of the sessions along with the presentation slides, as well as a short survey to gain your feedback. Thank you again for joining us today. I will now turn it over to Dan Lohman to get us started. Uh, thanks so much, Catherine, and thanks everyone for joining us um, in what is our afternoon, morning for some of you and evening for others. Um, it's a cold and blustery day in Chicago. I hope it's nicer where you are. Um, I'm delighted to have Kyle uh, on the webinar with us today. Um, I've had the pleasure to work with Kyle for the last year or so at Vanderbilt since he's joined uh, the leadership of the annual giving team there. Um, and I really think uh, he's going to add a tremendous amount of value to this conversation as we talk about uh, Vanderbilt's specific experience of developing an enhanced leadership annual giving program. Uh, and the way we want to break up today's conversation, uh, I want to talk for a few minutes sort of strategically and structurally about the importance of leadership annual giving, which is a part of the development program that I think has been underserved uh, in many programs and that I'm starting to realize is really a critical part of the growth of any program. Uh, and I mean that in the entire advancement operation, not just the growth of an annual fund. Uh, and then uh, we'll turn it over to Kyle for um, the second portion to talk about Vanderbilt's specific experience. And again, we welcome your questions through the, the chat function. Um, if you have any technical issues, that sort of thing, directions on, on how to respond to those. Um, I, I, we want to talk uh, broadly um, about how leadership annual giving fits into the big picture. And I want to introduce a term called gap giving, which I'll come back to in just a minute. Uh, and why leadership annual giving is important, uh, where within your organization might annual giving fit, and then you know, the, the obvious questions of how do we staff it and fund it, as well as how do we identify prospects and manage prospects that are no longer direct mail respondents and are not major or principal gift prospects necessarily, uh, and then, of course, Vanderbilt's own experience. Um, the term that I want to introduce today, which I've taken to calling gap giving, is that space between gifts that many organizations are good at raising through direct mail or telefund programs or direct response in relatively small gifts. Um, sometimes they're under $100, sometimes they're under $10, um, and the space between those kinds of gifts and gifts that we associate with going out and seeing people and developing personal relationships and identifying specific areas of interest and soliciting them for what we might consider to be a major gift. Um, it, certainly at most of the clients that I work with, the range between $5,000 and $20,000 I think fits squarely in that gap giving area. But depending on your organization, that could go down, say, as low as $500. At some other organizations, it might go up to $100,000. Um, if an annual gift in your particular environment is a gift below $10,000, which is a definition I've seen used before, insert whatever number works for you, and a major gift is $50,000 or more, as it often is, or $25,000 or 100000 
what happens to gifts within that range? I mean, uh, uh, the obvious question is, how do we manage that? How do we identify prospects at that level and solicit them? Because that's generally not enough money, whatever range we set there, to go send somebody out to visit face-to-face -face and, and take up major gift resources to develop that relationship. Um, and uh, it's generally more money than we're going to be able to get through a letter, that uh, a gift commitment of 5000 or 10000 or $25,000 on an annual basis. Uh, generally, donors at that level are going to want more personal interaction. And without a specific program to target that, it tends to get lost, hence the term gap giving. And we often see lots of donors and dollars coming at the small gift levels and lots of donors and dollars coming at the major gift levels, but a um, uh, sort of an, an indentation in the pyramid, if you will, where giving is smaller in that middle range. And then I think that there's a practical question about who gets credit. Um, many of us are evaluated on the number of visits we make, the number of dollars that we bring into our partic particular program areas. And if, uh, Again, the definition of an annual gift is 10000 and a major gift is 50000 If a $25,000 gift comes in, do we credit a major gift officer for securing that gift, even though it was lower than the amount of money they're supposed to be targeting? Do we uh, money to the annual fund in that situation, even though they didn't necessarily bring the gift in or it didn't come in through a traditional annual giving mechanism? Uh, and I think those are questions that should be resolved in every organization. And then the biggest question, you know, who spends time thinking about this? How do we look at donors with capacity and interest in those uh, gift ranges and give somebody the authority and the responsibility to try to make a difference there? Um, this is a gift table, uh, a historical gift table, looking backwards at the money raised by an institution um, there's a lot going on on this slide. Um, this I used a performing arts example here, but I find uh, across organizations there's uh, only limited variation. Um, what you're seeing, take the top row, for example, the, the gift range of a million dollars or more. This organization had 28 donors who've given total gifts of a million dollars or more. Together, they've given $63.8 million dollars. Um, and if you go across to the last two columns, the cumulative percentage of donors and the cumulative percentage of dollars, you can see that those 28 people are just 0.06% of the donor population, but 28.9% of the dollars that have been raised. So clearly, principal gifts are extremely important in this environment. Um, in a lot of colleges and universities, uh, sometimes that top number is 40% or 50% of the dollars in other kinds of membership-based organizations or, or public broadcasting, Red Cross type environments, sometimes that number is as low as 10 or 15 percent, but it's usually a very significant proportion of the total. And our eyes, and certainly our leadership's eyes, tend to go to the top of this list, but I want to draw your attention to the middle, the just in the $10,000 to $50,000 range here, um, the uh, number of uh, donors, the percentage of donors, is almost 14% of the donors to this organization have made gifts between $10,000 and $50,000. Again, that's gifts totaling between $10,000 and $50,000, so that it easily works out to 10 years of $1,000 gift level giving, um, and uh, it accounts for um, uh, a, I'm sorry, it's 14% of their dollars were raised in that area, and about 6% of uh, the donor population in that particular range has made uh, gifts in that particular level. So you get a sense that um, there's a there there, if you will. There are people that have uh, an interest and a capability and a history to give in those ranges. And if you look down at the bottom, and I don't know if it's displaying this way on your screens, but some of the last numbers have been cut off here, and I apologize for that. It's just in the projection. Um, if you look down at the bottom, this organization had almost 21,000 donors who'd given between a penny and a hundred dollars, the very traditional low end of the annual fund, the postcard gifts, the telephone gifts. Um, together, those 20,000 people have given $684,000 out of a total of $220 million raised. Um, I think that that's an important point as we think about annual funds. If we were going to try to double 
our revenue stream from that particular part of the pyramid, we'd have to go up to having 42,000 donors and our net gain would only be another $684,000, less than a third of a percent of the total that's been raised. Again, it's not to say we don't want to focus on that. Participation is important, particularly in higher education. Uh, gifts at that level, they're often first-time gifts that build a pipeline toward larger gifts later on. But if our program's growth is based on an annual fund approach through the low end of the model, uh, institutions will generally struggle to hit their dollar value targets. Um, major gifts don't fall from trees. They generally take anywhere from many months to a few years to generate real financial results in that regard. Um, and therefore, they don't solve immediate budgetary relief problems and they don't generate a, a pipeline in the same sense, which brings us back to why that middle range is so important. Um, dollar, I'll, I'll get to you know, some of the importance issues here, but uh, let's talk about a couple of definitions for a second. Um, I am deliberately used the, uh, the pronoun I here. How does Dan Lohman define an annual gift? I define it as an annual, renewable, repeatable gift. This is a gift that when we look at it, we can say hand on heart that we believe that this is an amount of money that this person is both capable and has a possibility of renewing next year. Um, that's why a one-time gift of a million dollars for a capital project, even if it's Bill Gates who could write the check for a million dollars again next year, to me it's not an annual gift. It's not repeatable in that sense. Um, the, and then I might narrow it further by saying gifts to certain funds, and that's certainly something um, that we've done in some environments. Um, at Vanderbilt is an example of that where we defined out of the hundreds of funds into which gifts can be directed, a percentage of those were clearly considered annual, uh, you know, narrowly restricted or unrestricted contributions. You may have a different internal definition, which is fine. Uh, a lot of places say a gift of X amount or below a certain amount is an annual gift. Um, I think that presents problems because if somebody gives a $10,000 gift through a major gift officer to a restricted purpose, I'm not sure that's an annual gift, especially if it's not going to be given again next year or is unlikely to be given again next year. Um, some organizations do it based on the mechanism. If it came in through email, mail, or the phone, it's an annual gift. If it came in through any other contact, it's not an annual gift. Again, you can see the same kinds of counting issues there. Uh, and then gifts related to restrictions. Um, many, many organizations have a fund, uh, the, the college fund, the president's fund, et cetera, which constitutes the annual fund. In those kinds of cases, I would say there's not really a big issue here. There's no competition with my definition. If a gift goes into that fund and it's repeatable, I'd call that an annual gift. If it goes into that fund and it's not repeatable, it's really not an annual gift. It might be a fund gift, but it's not an annual gift. So back to why it's important. Um, money raised at these leadership annual giving levels of, say, $5,000 to $25,000 each year are non-trivial sums of money. Uh, 13, 14 percent of the dollars raised in my example organization might be a little more, might be a little less in other places, but it's not 0.3 percent of the total. It's not rounding error. This is real money that can be spent, and uh, obviously most institutions are in a position to want that. Um, most organizations have more prospects that are able to give at those levels than they are at higher levels. Um, one of the reasons major and principal gifts don't fall from trees is there just aren't that many people out there who can write a check for $100,000. Thankfully, that number is not infinitesimally small, and, and many organizations have a healthy population there, in some cases even a large population. But you might have three, four, ten times that number of people who could give a five or ten or fifteen thousand dollar gift than you have who could give a hundred thousand or a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar gift and again if we only rely on the usual dichotomy of direct response and then major gifts sometimes we leave those people uh, in a place where they're not getting adequate attention that's going to cause them to renew at any level much less upgrade um, Gifts at this level are typically realizable very quickly, uh, and something we'll get to in just a minute. I'm a firm believer that an annual giving officer, someone who's going out and soliciting leadership annual gifts, um, don't need to do a lot of cultivation visits. In fact, they can open their introductory phone call about why they want to visit to talk about making a gift of a certain size 
um, to a particular area of an institution, uh, and, and even if you're not ready to be that aggressive, it, it, it's pretty much one visit per ask, maybe two visits per ask, as opposed to a more typical seven to ten visits in the run-up to a major gift. Um, that means money coming in this year. It's it's what uh, uh, boards and uh, finance officers call budget relief dollars. They're coming in right now. They can be spent immediately. Um, related to that, gifts at this level are often for general use expenditures. Uh, they, they may be entirely unrestricted, and the institution can use them to buy paper clips and, and, and uh, pay the phone bill. Or even if they are restricted, they're restricted broadly within a unit. So this is a gift going to arts and sciences, or this is a gift that's going to the galleries. Uh, and um, there are the same number of strings that are tied to this. And, and I would go so far as to recommend, generally speaking, Gifts at this level, you should try to avoid major restrictions. Give people some ability to direct those dollars, but if we start to put a lot of rules on how that money is uh, going to be spent, we run into a significant problem with counting it and tracking it, which is a cost, and a $2,500 gift that now has $1,000 worth of administrative costs is a lot less worthwhile. Donors at the leadership annual giving levels present a very healthy pipeline for future major gifts. If you have someone who's been a $250 annual donor for the last few years, you're able to meet with them, solicit them for a gift of $5,000 and be successful in that regard. Frankly, you've got a major gift prospect on your hands as long as there's additional capability there. This is an obvious next step in developing a relationship. It is a self-funding form of pipeline development. If we send a gift officer out to go, a major gift officer, to feel out how somebody feels in terms of bigger gifts or an ongoing relationship with an institution, that visits a cost until they ultimately make that major gift. If they make a $5,000 or $10,000 gift during that visit, not only have we made real headway on qualifying those prospects, uh, we, we've also paid for the visit and then some. And I think as importantly, um, as many of you know, there's no college degree in being a fundraiser. Um, that We don't have a lot of labs that we can send people off to for six weeks and practice doing cultivation meetings and solicitations. Most of these uh, fundraising jobs that we're all involved with are um, based on your own personal experience doing that kind of work. Uh, and it can be difficult and, frankly, a little terrifying to take an inexperienced, relatively young gift officer and send them out to talk to the CEO of a corporation about a major gift, um, especially when that discussion about the major gift may not come up for many months. We're effectively sending people out to go make friends with some of these people, and those people may not want to be friends with that particular gift officer. Uh, the leadership annual giving approach creates a framework where we're making it very clear that this person is going out to uh, have a conversation about a specific gift. It sets the stage for that conversation, and it creates a training ground and a confidence-building measure for gift officers that may be our next best major gift and principal gift officers but don't have the experience yet. Um, it also builds an internal pipeline of gift officers so that we're not in that constant struggle to find find a good major gift officers from other institutions, which is a zero-sum game. So how does all this actually work? Um, it's certainly easier said than done, but I actually think it's a fairly simple framework. You know, one, you need to have a case for support. Just like major gifts, uh, you need to have a $100,000 idea to make a $100,000 solicitation. That's true at $5,000 as well. Where is this money going to go? And you can see a, a quote that I pulled from uh, an actual conversation from a leadership annual gift officer. Very specific. Gifts made to the Arts and Sciences Fund allow the university to support 51 scholarships, fund eight graduate research projects, and upgrade three laboratories, followed up with a bunch of materials about who these 51 students were, what these graduate research projects were, and what these labs now are capable of doing. Um, the focus is on the institution. It's specific. A common uh, set of resistance that I hear is we don't really know where these unrestricted annual fund dollars go, and we don't want to tell a donor that we use it to pay the utility bills of, of the department. And that's entirely understandable and, frankly, advisable not to emphasize that. But we don't have to say 40% of this money is going for administrative costs. We can talk about the portions of those funds that are going to the kinds of things we know motivate donors, which tend to be things that 
directly impact your mission delivery. And you know, I've used a higher education example here that applies to any other organization, whether it's broadcast programming, uh, whether it's exhibitions in a, a, in a, a cultural organization environment, whether it's research projects in a zoo or aquarium, and, and you can keep going on down the list. But you have to have a case. It's the same principle as major gifts, just the case might be a little different and a little less specific to the person. Um, Next, we have to develop a list of prospects. Who do we want to talk to about these gifts? And I'm going to talk more about this in just a second, and Kyle's going to talk at some length about it, so I'm going to move on. Um, identify a person who's going to go do this. Um, it doesn't help to have a list of prospects in a case for support if someone's not going to go out and ask people to make those contributions. In a smaller organization, that might be taking your director of annual giving and telling them that for a day a week on average, we want you on the road going to do those face-to-face -face solicitations. Um, in a larger environment, it might be a full-time staff or, or uh, as Kyle will talk about in the case of Vanderbilt, several people and effectively a department within a department that's tasked to do those things. Um, and then uh, track those prospects. Once we've identified a leadership annual giving prospect, the the language might be a bit different, but the process is the same as major gifts. Is this a qualified prospect? Are they going to do this and are they interested? How close are they to making a gift? And once they've made a gift, how close are we to asking them again? If on general issues related to organization and staffing, um, again, broadly speaking, my view is that leadership annual giving should fit within the structure of an existing annual giving program. So if annual giving today means the direct response components of friends and patrons at gift society levels, uh, it often makes sense to tack this on top of that dollar-wise or next to it organizationally with leadership up through whoever's overseeing the broad annual giving program. But I don't think that there is a single best way to do this. Um, it, it, what we might call leadership annual giving is it might just as accurately be called low-end major gifts. That's clearly not as appealing to a donor and your business card should never say low-end major gift officer. Um, but uh, w within that context, it may very well be on the, uh, the major gift side organizationally and from a management perspective. And if you're a decentralized environment where each school unit or college is running its own annual fund, um, it's conceivable that the annual, the leadership annual program would have to fit within those college structures, or you'd have to attempt to set up a leadership annual giving structure that's centralized, leaving the direct mail portions to the schools or units. Um, and then in terms of how to staff it, uh, again, I'll, I'll let Kyle talk about his own experience because he uh, just went through the process of recruiting a director as well as officers and support within this area. Um, but, you know, things to keep in mind, and, and maybe from my point of view here, this is almost how you pitch this to your leadership as opposed to how you actually go find people. Um, but as I said before, it's a great training ground for less experienced fundraisers. If somebody's relatively new to this business, this is a good low-risk uh, place to test them out and give them a chance to build their skills. Um, it's an outstanding place for closers, and we've all met those people, the ones who are really good at going right for the ask. They don't necessarily want to take the time to build extremely long-term relationships at an institution. They don't necessarily want to manage a team. They just like talking about your institution. They like soliciting people for gifts. Let's put them in a position where they can use those skills to the best effect. Um, and I use an example here of, say, an alumni relations person who wants to get onto the gift side of things. Um, the alumni relations, you could put that in a lot of places, communications, you know, other areas. Uh, someone who's interacting with your constituents already, a special events person, for example, who actually wants to start making solicitations and generating a revenue stream. This is a great way to get them into that without taking a big risk on their ability to be successful in that regard, again, given that we don't, most of us don't have very formal training programs for our gift officers. Identifying leadership prospects, uh, you know, keep in mind, at most organizations, the pool is pretty big. The number of people who can write a check for $100,000 is pretty small, and the number of people who can write a check for 1000 or 5000 is significantly larger. We just have to give them a reason to want to do this, and we obviously don't want to uh, poach from a major gifts program and uh, go after 1000 and $5,000 gifts when we could be talking about fifty dollars or $100,000 gifts. 
Um, but for example, you know, look, say, at donors who have given $1,000 at some point in the last five years, um, have some evidence of capacity, which can be anything from, you know, that the street they live on has really big houses to doing a wealth screening or using internal research ratings. Um, Long-term consistent donors that have evidence of capacity that haven't been visited, that aren't assigned to gift officers at the moment. Um, even a major gift prospect, if you have an internal rating process or you use an external screening service, you may have a list of people that are uh, preliminarily recommended as being good major gift prospects, but your major gift officers just don't have time to go see them. If we have somebody who can do 200 visits a year, which I don't think is out of the question for a gift officer, even if it's 100 visits a year, um, that's a way to move through that list very quickly to see if they are going to accept the meeting and if they're going to make a gift. Um, th there's a lot of different ways to pull this list. Um, and, and you can see in my bottom bullet point there, expect leadership annual giving officers to do 50 to 100% more visits than major gift officers and three to four times the number of asks. A major gift officer, a very successful major gift officer, may submit only between 12 and 20 major gift proposals a year. Um, I would expect a, a leadership annual giving officer to be able to make 60 to 100 solicitations. Obviously, we're missing a zero on the end of the dollar values, uh, so they need to make more asks to generate the same kinds of revenue. But that also needs to be clear in the expectation that we really want leadership annual giving officers to get out in front of prospects, have those conversations, and make those solicitations. Um, this is also a, a, an example from uh, an actual institution, and uh, let me explain what's going on here. This institution's rated its population into a, a group of donors of less than $100, the, the traditional very low levels of the annual fund, which aren't even reflected on this slide, and a major gift population of $25,000 or more, also not reflected on this slide. Um, so what's here are people that the organization has determined are decent prospects, I'll explain that in a second, for gifts at the 100, 500,000, 2,500, and a range of about 5,000 to 25,000 above that. The way the ratings were determined was looking at past giving primarily over the last five years. What was the largest gift they made? How consistently had they given? And then throwing in some other external factors. But what do we know about how old they are, uh, where they work, the um, uh, some wealth characteristics that are widely available from a number of different both internal and external sources. And the way to read this is in column number two, $2,500 recommended solicitation amount, this organization has 546 people that they've rated at that level. 521 of them are donors below level, meaning their largest gift to the organization is less than the 546, uh, I'm sorry, is less than the $2,500 that we're recommending. So they're the upgrade opportunity. But on average, these people have largest gifts of $792. So this isn't a wealth screening. These aren't people who just appear to have money that we're going to go out and ask for more money. These are people who've already made gifts averaging about $800 that we think are the best prospects to go from $800 on average to $2,500 on average. And you can see uh, modeled out here with relatively low success rates, Again, the money is non-trivial. Uh, just in that $2,500 category, if just one out of every 10 of those upgrade prospects actually does it, this school uh, would be able to generate almost $89,000 in new annualized revenue and develop a pool of some number between a few and 52 new major gift prospects. If they get one out of every four, that's 130 people, totaling $222,000. And if you sum up the list, which, keep in mind, there's no acquisition component to this. All of these people had been donors in the last five years. Um, but if you sum up the 10% upgrade rate, we're talking about $340,000 or $850,000 of the 25% upgrade rate, which is ambitious but doable. Uh, this is an annual fund that's currently raising just over $1.5 million. So we're looking at being able to grow that to $1.8 million or $2.3 million, again, relatively quickly, based on a combined communications and face-to-face -face annual giving structure and soliciting gifts. Um, 
finally, I want to talk about uh, uh, tracking, again, broadly. And what you're looking at here is a major GIFs prospect management and tracking structure. Um, again, there's no one way to do this. This is purely illustrative. Um, and, and you can see what we've done in this particular case is there are six stages of behavior, um, uh, of activity with a gift officer, a time stamp, how long we think someone should generally remain in a stage before we start to either aggressively try to move them to the next stage or reevaluate their status as a prospect, um, and, and a clear definition of an exit from the stage. We don't just move from early cultivation to advanced cultivation because we feel like we're making progress, but because we can actually answer the question, are there one or more identified donor interests that align with priorities, and we estimate 12 to 18 months uh, leading up to a solicitation. Um, th this model, while again for major gifts, the same model applies to the leadership annual giving structure, just with some different definitions and some different time frames clearly a much shorter time frames and perhaps we collapse some of these. We go from qualification to advanced cultivation. Um, we take the meeting, we have a conversation about what they might be interested in and we quickly get to the ask. Um, most donor management systems are set up to pay attention to these kinds of things for major gifts. Again, my advice is set up a, a comparable structure on the leadership annual giving side. Um, I, I want to uh, thanks for listening to, uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to my portion of uh, this. And I want to turn it over to Kyle now to talk about the specific experience at Vanderbilt. And he may very well contradict half the things that I've said, and I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> You've done a terrific job at, at Vanderbilt, and, and I think you'll all learn a lot from that. So, Kyle, it's it's all yours. All right, great, Dan. Uh, thanks very much, and good, af good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for participating in today's webinar. Um, why don't we move to the next slide? We'll get right into our agenda for my part of the presentation. So I want to set up. I want to spend a few minutes setting up uh, some context for Vanderbilt's strategy when it comes to annual giving, and then spend the remainder of our time talking about how leadership annual giving fits into that, <clears throat> and also discuss some of our sort of um, near-term ex or early experiences and early results with our leadership annual giving program. And I definitely want to save some time at the end to ask uh, to answer questions that you guys have too. So um, why don't we move on to the next slide? So Vanderbilt Vanderbilt has been a very successful fundraising institution. They have a long track record of doing very good. And in terms of um, we just we just closed the campaign, shape the future, uh, raised 1.97 billion dollars over the course of 10 years. Um, but, but Vanderbilt has been even more disproportionately reliant on gifts at the high end of the pyramid than even our peer schools. Um, that is within a context of our alumni population holding Vanderbilt in very high regard. The people who, who went to school here really love Vanderbilt. Um, all of our experience in talking with alumni, all of our market research shows that people have had a, a very positive experience here. Uh, but they only give it a rate of 23%. And um, in comparison with our, our sort of peer set, uh, that is relatively low. So Vanderbilt really does possess the right characteristics to uh, meaningfully grow its, its uh, annual giving program. Uh, and of course, the leadership annual giving piece is an important part of our, part of our strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So overall, when we're thinking about where we want our annual giving program to go, I mean, it will come as no surprise to any of you that our areas of focus are alumni participation. Um, our aspiration is to grow one percentage point per year. Uh, for us, that means about 1,000 additional donors per year to gain one point. Uh, and then, of course, to increase our unrestricted fundraising results. Uh, a third overall goal that the leadership annual giving team can really contribute to is helping build a broader and more generous major gift pipeline. So overall, when we think about annual giving at Vanderbilt, those are our, are our goals. And we're thinking about these goals in terms of a five-year time horizon. Obviously, we want to produce near-term results, but we also want to lay a foundation for producing better results longer term. Next. I want to say just a few words about how we are sort of thinking about our audiences, um, and then to talk a little bit about what some of the strategic implications are for those groups. 
So our current donors, and this is this is referring only to the undergraduate alumni population, but there's about 15,000 of them who contribute on an annual basis. Um, they're retained at a rate of about 70%. And one, one thing that this leadership annual giving effort is going to help us do is to sort of optimize our outreach for the top 20, 20 to 25% of that file. Um, as, as Dan pointed out earlier, this sort of notion of this gap area where, you know, where our leadership annual prospects reside, you know, I, I would consider that to be the top 20% of our, you know, our current donor population, and that's what this leadership annual giving group is going to be targeted at. Uh, next, and then if you set, you know, if you set the current donors aside, we also have our episodic donors and our non-donors. Obviously, uh, these groups sort of behave differently relative to Vanderbilt University than our current donors. Um, I think we have big opportunities here to, you know, uh, increase our revenue and participation results from from these populations because many of these people are engaged. At Vanderbilt, we have about 4,000 alumni who have, who have volunteered for Vanderbilt in some capacity in recent years, and about 50% of them made a gift last year. Well, that's really good sort of compares, in comparison to our overall average. You know, I think our volunteer constituency should be giving at, at higher rates, 60%, 70%, depending upon the type of volunteers and they're involved with. And that's going to be part of our sort of effort going forward is figuring out ways to uh, better acquire the engaged non-donor, and of course, young alumni are sort of the, the future of uh, the future pipeline at, at Vanderbilt, as it is at every institution. And uh, I'm sure these proportions match with many of yours. Um, they represent about 25% of the file, and by young alumni, I mean graduates of the last 10 years. And 14% of them have given a gift last year. So obviously that's going to need to be sort of a growth segment for us if we intend to meet our aspirational goal of increasing our participation by one point per year and also growing our dollar proceeds. And then and the last thing about these episodic donors is about 50% of the file has made a gift over the past 10 years. So if you add all these things together or if, or if you contemplate all these facts together, it, 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 it speaks to me to say that there's real opportunity at Vanderbilt. Um, to both grow our participation and our and our um, unrestricted fundraising results. So next, so kind of the the, the strategic implications from a broader perspective. Um, you know, we want our volunteers and attendees to be donors. Uh, we want our episodic donors to be regular donors, and we want our young alumni population to become more aware of the role of philanthropy at Vanderbilt and how it's contributed to their experience as a student and students to follow them. And we also want to take more ownership and sort of the um the realization of those of those objectives. So that's kind of a little bit of a framework and a context of how we are thinking about annual giving at, at Vanderbilt. We can go ahead and move on. Um, <clears throat> these last two groups obviously are, are um of little or no operational importance to annual giving. Um, obviously, the managed major donors and prospects are very important to Vanderbilt, you know, but they're being handled in a very high-touch way. Um, our major gift officers are cultivating those relationships and closing those gifts, and so they're sort of no operational concern to us. And the long-lapsed people and the never donors um, and the long-time unengaged non-donors, you know, we're not going to spend very much time on unless they're young people and they haven't had yet had an opportunity to sort of drift. Um, so let's move on. This slide here is sort of Vanderbilt's experience when it comes to our gift period, and it's another way to look at our leadership annual giving sort of pool. And I would say it squares roughly with the slide that, that, that Dan had, had presented earlier. Um, but our, our leadership annual giving group comes from this population who's giving, you know, roughly between $1,000 and, you know, $25,000 per year. Um, overall, people making gifts to that level are giving 20, 22% of our gift revenue. I think it's very interesting to look at that uh, $1,000 to $10,000 level and to see that it is proportionally more important from a revenue perspective than even the next level up and, of course, the next level down. And that's because so many more households can, can give gifts at that level. So that's 
those people are sort of squarely within our kind of radar, and those are the people who we are, you know, spending our time trying to reach out directly to. Uh, next. Very quickly, um, I want to go through three key initiatives um, that we are going to be pursuing as we as we seek to achieve those overall goals referenced in the first slide. Uh, this is a big one, increase the scope of our outreach. Um, essentially, we want to talk to a lot more people. Uh, bullet point number one there is visit hundreds of undiscovered prospects to the Leadership Annual Giving Team. Um, you know, we have a pretty ambitious travel schedule. We have a pretty ambitious target for the number of people that we want to visit. I'll get into that a little bit later. But we also want our volunteers to do more. Um, we want to enlist and empower hundreds of additional volunteers to reach our, our student population, our young population, and, and our reunion volunteers. Um, so this whole outreach idea is a very sort of central cornerstone, cornerstone to how we are uh, approaching our overall annual giving goals. Uh, number two, marketing and communications. Dan talked about the importance of a case and being able to link that to actual impact on campus. Uh, when I talk about building a stronger case for annual giving or Vanderbilt, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you need to be able to point to results, you know, at your institution. Uh, that's really important. I think it's a sort of minimum level of st service or a, st a stewardship standard uh, that we need to be providing to our donors. Uh, number two, we want to we want to learn more about, you know, what our alumni think of Vanderbilt, why they give, why they don't give. Are they aware of institutional direction? Uh, do they agree with it? What resonates with them, et cetera? So we're going to be carrying out some market research to better understand those dimensions of alumni attitude. Um, not spending time on non-productive segments. You know, there's too much to do with the productive segments. And there's a lot of upside with the productive segments. And that's where we want to be focusing our time and energy. And of course, uh, gaining a better understanding of what's working and what's not working within our not only leadership annual giving area but our direct marketing area and any other forms of outreach that we have in our program. So we want to understand what's working and not working. Uh, number three, stewardship. Um, you know, I, I view this as amongst our highest priorities uh, at Vanderbilt in our annual giving program. We want to recognize people for their loyalty. You know, a lot of people are never going to be able to make gifts, even at the $10,000 level. But collectively, over time, um, you know, their gifts do add up, and it's important to have a very sort of robust and deep donor population. And we need to recognize that behavior. So we want to be launching a loyalty program this spring. As part of that, we're going to be recognizing first-time donors to Vanderbilt. Um, and we also want to be, um, as, as Dan mentioned earlier, the importance of telling people how the gifts have been used on campus. That, that will be part of our stewardship repertoire going forward, is to tell people how their money has been used. So those are sort of a really sort of top line of, you know, our, our, our kind of three key initiative areas that we are pursuing, you know, this year and going forward um, to help advance the overall annual giving program. And the way we're structured here is that, um, you know, the annual giving team is part of the uh, University Central Development Shop. There is a counterpart medical center organization that reports into our medical center development area, all reporting up into a, a vice chancellor for development and alumni relations. And then in the university side, we have a, a marketing area, which is appeals and donor participation, a classes area, and then and then a, a leadership annual giving area, which is which is new to Vanderbilt. So now focusing in more on leadership annual giving, and they have a very straightforward role. Um, <clears throat> you know, a we want them to uh, broaden the community of, of donor support. I mean, that's that's pretty straightforward. Uh, as Dan said, it's it's sort of conceptually sort of easy to understand. It's 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 hard to do, and it requires a lot of sweat equity and a lot of hard work. Um, but that's that's the job. I mean, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. And, uh, you know, part of that is identifying and referring new major gift prospects. I mean, we are explicitly out there looking for new folks that we can then refer internally to our major gift team. Um, goals. Uh, in the first year, um, you know, primary focus is, is visits and outreach. You know, we want we want the team to be talking to people. We want the team to be visiting people who have never been visited before. 
we want the team to be talking with folks uh, who have been very generous but maybe not necessarily recognized for that uh, over time. So, so really this outreach piece is very, very important for us. And dollars are important too. At the end of the day, um, you know, university leadership is looking to our advancement areas or development areas to produce, you know, produce, produce revenue. And uh, so dollars are always going to be uh, a focus for us and something that we're looking at um, very closely. So, so here, this is a relatively new sort of enterprise or exercise. Um, I arrived at Vanderbilt in March, and um, you know, basically the first phase of this work was to hire the team. Uh, there was there was there was nobody in these positions. We started from scratch. Um, so the first phase of this work was to hire people and develop their portfolios. Um, and that basically went from April 1st to July 27th. Phase two, uh, July 28th to the present time, you know, that the team has been off the launching pad. They're off like a rocket. They're visiting lots of people. Um, and phase three is sort of the remainder of, of this year and, uh, and beyond. Um, so next... So um, hired a director. I was very fortunate to have lots of good talent within our existing department, and it turned out that that you know, I think three out of the five people we eventually hired came from from internal to to, to uh, Vanderbilt DAR. So that was that was sort of a, a gift. Um, <clears throat> hired one person externally and a, and, a, and a DAR assistant externally as well, and that person is a Vanderbilt alum. So I hired a director, three associate directors, and one assistant. Uh, the director was in place by June 6th, and then all of the hiring was completed by August 5th. And again, we had the sort of benefit of having a pretty deep reservoir of talent inside to draw from. So I think that helped speed that process along. At the end of the day, there's 3.75 FTEs, or staff equivalents, to, um, that are dedicated to this, this role of direct fundraising. Um, and this is the organizational chart <clears throat> that um, you know represents our, our leadership annual giving effort on the university central side. Again, the medical center also has a, a team of people who are um, dedicated to this leadership annual giving business. So the second part of that phase one was to create our portfolios. It was very helpful to uh, have the GGNA screening results to help prioritize the list. At least on the undergraduate alumni side, there is um, about 60,000 people in the file. Well, how do you prioritize that? You need to understand or know a little bit about who's in the file. So the GGNA ratings were e extremely useful in that regard. And that kind of narrowed it down to 4,000 plus potential prospects for us. And then it became a really sort of practical exercise. Or, okay, how do you get it from 4,000 to 2,000 in order for us to meet our 200 visit per 200 visit per year goal? And we basically just ended up prioritizing our population by geographic density uh, to end up with about six or seven major markets. Um, you know, when we're trying to visit as many people as we are, we wanted to be able to make sure that we're maximizing the use of our time when we go to a Washington D.C. or New York or Chicago, uh, so that we can, you know, see a bunch of people while they're there. And so it just made sense to um, organize our portfolios according to our major markets and by geographic density. And then, you know, you got to look at the individual records. You know, when you're when you're when you're looking at making a trip to wherever. Uh, you want to make sure that you're making the best use of your time, and literally you go down and look at you know, your, your donor's giving history, contact reports, and try to find the best possible mix of people <clears throat> um, that you can. I think it's really important to note that you know, GG&A takes the work sort of to a certain point, and then, and then after that point, it's up to the institution to sort of learn more about these individual people you know, and, do, and do the fundraising. So it was very helpful to get that prioritized down to a manageable list that we could win sort of th that, that, that we could then use to take it forward to the next step. Um, so phase two, moving on, but before we got to phase two, excuse me, um, going, going back to this important principle when it comes to portfolio management, so this was new at Vanderbilt and it was really important for us to adhere to this, this principle that, um, you know, the leadership annual giving team adhered to the same prospect management rules that everyone else adhered to. And it's very important uh, for the team to have a dedicated group of people that is their responsibility to follow up on. 
you know, we didn't we didn't want major gift officers or leadership annual giving officers sort of wading into others' portfolios. And so one of the one of the very basic principles we have here, it's very important, is to you know have the leadership annual giving folks operate according to the same prospect management principles that everyone else operates in accordance with. Phase two, <clears throat> off to the races. Um, you know, I, I really wanted this team to be very externally focused. You know, I, I think going out and visiting with alums is the is kind of like the only priority. Um, so our training philosophy is like, you know, 80% in the field. That's how people learn. That's how they get the job done. And um, that's how they become more and more polished in their work. Uh, and I have to say that um, that they've done a terrific job of of, of following that sort of directive. Um, there all there also is ongoing formal training. Uh, we do try to get the leadership annual giving team in front of people on the academic side, uh, you know, people in development uh, who know more about different specialty areas of the business, like planned giving. And that training is is ongoing. And of course, you know, there's there's mentorship here. Um, the director of leadership annual giving, myself, other experienced development officers um, have made themselves very accessible to the team uh, and can sort of coach them as they go. So from July 28th to the present time, which is, what, two and a half months, three months, <clears throat> we've um, scheduled 260 visits, 197 of which have been complete. Um, roughly 40% in Nashville and 60% in other major markets, which puts us on pace for about a 700 visit sort of rate over a 12 month time period. So that's that's pretty active. Uh, next, <clears throat> it's taken us about three and a half to four calls required to obtain one visit, which is kind of what we had, had expected. Um, so that's 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 going as expected. We we ask everyone for a gift. That's a standard part of the visit. <clears throat> you know, there there are other dimensions uh, to the visit, but the standard ask is five thousand dollars. Dan had presented that slide earlier, which showed the various stages of development. We basically sort of compressed all those stages, essentially, except with the exception of stewardship, uh, into one. Um, and as Dan pointed out earlier, it's a great qualification tool. You learn right away, um, you know, what people are thinking. Um, so it has proved to be an effective ask amount. It's not so high that it seems out of this world for someone to be coming to you asking you for a contribution. It would be one thing if you were asking people out of the blue, you know, for $50,000. $5,000 seems to be a pretty reasonable figure. Um, and, of course, it's also an opportunity to thank people, um, you know, do some direct face-to-face -face research, inquire about attitudes, gather intelligence, et cetera, and finally raise awareness about university direction. So that's kind of like what an uh, agenda looks like when we're talking to people in the field. Next. You know, I think I think uh, early term results are positive. Um, again, we are just, just now getting into this. Um, it's hard to read too much into what we've experienced so far. But uh, I would say that a solid 80% of the visits result in some type of verbal commitment to do more this year. Um, you know, people are very receptive to our calls. People have been very welcoming to us. Uh, most of the people we visit love Vanderbilt, and I do think they, they intend to do more. Uh, $51,000 in signed commitments. Uh, that number is not large, but when you think about the dyna dynamics of the program, I think it's pretty good. I mean, we're we're dropping the ask on people as we visit them. Most of the time, people have to go home and say, you know, ask their spouse, discuss it, think about it, plan for their budget for the remainder of the calendar year, et cetera. So these are just signed commitments that people made on the spot. And we've identified five major gift prospects. These are brand new people to our major gift portfolio that we've identified. And and these assumptions uh, regarding, you know, goodwill amongst Vanderbilt alumni are confirmed. I mean, I, I think we have a, a, a reservoir of goodwill out there that is very, very significant. And uh, people are happy to talk with us. Next. So far, so good. Um, I, you know, I'd say I'm very pleased with our experience with this so far. Um, I think we do absolutely expect these prospects to uh, increase our support this calendar year. Um, you know, this this this, um, this prospect pool refinement process is going to be ongoing. Um, you know, there, there are names coming in, there are names going out. 
you know, and I think I think it's going to take some time to get to a settled portfolio that represents, you know, the actual sort of best of the best within our um, leadership annual giving kind of population. So that's going to be an ongoing process. And we're going to find that many of these folks are going to, you know, remain very high quality leadership annual donors, you know, people who we're going to be able to um, continue to move up the pipeline, even if their upper end is, you know, in the $20,000 range or the $25,000 range, that's certainly worth a visit in an ongoing sort of annual relationship. Our major market areas geographically are keeping us busy for now. I think it'll keep us busy, you know, always, you know, because there are always going to be new people. But um, as we, as we, you know, screen those prospects, as we talk to them, as we visit them, uh, we will be able to step into some secondary markets, which are obviously smaller cities and so forth. They'll become more important uh, as we move forward. Um, so those are some top-line lessons. It's the, in, in the conclusion, <clears throat> you know, this, this leadership annual giving piece is a very key dimension to our to our annual giving strategy at Vanderbilt. It's very, very important for us. Uh, and I think it's complementary to everything else we do in annual giving and what we do in development. Uh, so it has its own role, its own important and meaningful role that's complementary to our other business. And these people are out there. You know, I, I absolutely think they're out there. I like Dan's term, sort of like the, the gap. Um, you know, these people are, in, in terms of their household, have made a very significant commitment to our institutions. Um, I mean, how many how many five thousand dollar checks does the average household write in a year? Well, it's probably not many. And so, the people who do that, you know, from their perspective, it's a big deal. And I think I think it's I think it's incumbent on us to to honor that and also to um, continue to cultivate those relationships um, to their logical sort of endpoint. And the best way to do this is to get out there and talk to people. You know, whether we have volunteers who are out there advocating for alma mater or your institution, or we have professionals who are out there um, asking people to uh, stay involved and support. I mean, that's the best way. Uh, getting in front of these people and talking with them is is, is, is profoundly useful for our organizations, for our programs. And um, you know, I would I would encourage you to evaluate you know whether or not a leadership annual giving effort makes sense at, at your school. And that uh, concludes the presentation. I think we have just a short amount of time for some Q&A. I, I do appreciate your time and listening, and I hope this has been helpful for you. Kyle, thanks uh, so much for that. It's really, really helpful stuff. We have a lot of questions, and I know we're pressing up against uh, 1 o'clock Central in the hour we said we were going to take away from all of you. Um, so we're going to cover a couple of them here. And as uh, Catherine mentioned at the outset, uh, all of the other questions uh, that we're able to respond to, we'll write up a response, and, and you'll receive an email message with our written responses to, to all those questions. Um, the one that we want to start with um, is for an organization with a very small staff and only one annual giving person, how would you recommend we implement a leadership annual giving plan, which is a terrific question and, of course, applies to a lot of organizations. Um, uh, I think there's probably two major areas that make sense to me. One is given the dollar value benefit of a leadership annual giving program, I would argue that it makes sense to carve out a portion of your time, even if it's only very small, to take on some of those responsibilities yourself if you're able to do that. Even if you take a day a month to go out and visit prospects and ask them at these higher levels, again, that pays for itself, generally speaking. And the, the secondary benefit is that if you're successful doing this one day out of every 22 workdays a month, um, and you're then able to show a, a revenue stream that's coming in from that, you might be able to make an argument that fully staffing that or, or taking a half time of somebody's role to move into that makes sense. I think all the broad principles apply equally. Um, Catherine, do you want to give us a, another couple of questions, and um, Kyle and I can take a stab? Um, yeah. Uh, as of today, you said you've made... 197 completed visits, uh, totaling $51,000, mm -hmm. uh, meaning your average gift uh, to the visit ratio is a little more than $258 per visit. Does your leadership believe the ROI is high enough to justify the cost? 
I, I would say that it's way, way too early to p apply that ROI metric on our work. I mean, I, th I think, I think, um, you know, as Dan was talking about earlier, I mean, in, in the major gift space, it might take seven visits to get a gift, and if you applied that ROI logic on that work this early, the ROI would be zero. And you know, so. So I think I think the um, the true measure for us is going to be something that materializes a little bit down the road. I do think our our early term sort of um, benchmark is going to be what happens with the people who we visited by the end of the calendar year, because that's when people naturally make that's when a lot of people naturally make um, you know charitable contribution decisions. And so we're going to be monitoring very closely, you know, what our what our population of people, you know, that that, that we've seen do by the end of the calendar year. Um, I think I think you know I think going forward beyond that, as we get into year, the finish the the conclusion of year one and the conclusion of year two, uh, we'll have a much deeper sort of reservoir of data to look at that's more reflective of the actual contributions of the theme to our overall effort. Um, so that's how I would answer that question. Thank you. Um, we have a, a time for just a couple more questions. Again, we're going to answer the rest by email. Um, and uh, Kyle, I knew this was going to happen. I warned you, they're all for you. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, next question um, comes from a, a, a good friend of ours. And the question is, how does the Vanderbilt team pass prospects to the major gift officers? What's that process? I, I would say in real time. So. Um, as as a leadership annual giving prospect is out in the field and they discover someone, literally they come back to the office after their trip and they go to the development officer responsible for the particular area of interest of the donor and say, hey, I found somebody. So, so I think that's kind of the best way to do it. Obviously, you have sort of a good lead. You don't want much time to elapse before you refer somebody. Um, and so we've been doing that in real time. I, I do think as we get more into this, there will probably, you know, our, our work will probably warrant some type of more formalized process where we look at the pool of people we visited over the past six months, year, whatever, and we identify who's our, you know, who's our top 10% and how many of these people should we think about referring sort of in batches. But But as we find people, we've been referring them directly as we go. Um, and then two related questions that I think you can probably take at once. Um, the, the first question is, what are the logistics of closing a gift? Uh, do your annual fund officers take gift cards along with, uh, with them on visits? And the related question is, have you developed leave-behind communications pieces for donors? Uh, yes and yes. Um, we, do have, we, do, we do bring along a, a pledge form. Uh, we do bring along a leave behind. Um, you know, it's 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 as 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 is evidenced by the number of people who make gifts on the spot. You know, most people want to chew on this decision for at least a day or two. Um, you know, when we when we set up the visits, they know why we're coming. You know, we're going to be on a fundraising call, um, but it's not clear. You know, what the amount is going to be, uh, and people need some time to make that decision on their own time frame. Uh, but we do have something that we can leave behind, um, and it's sort of up to the uh, you know, leadership annual giving officer's discretion whether they leave that behind or not. Um, and I think we're out of time for questions, unfortunately. Uh, thank you all for your participation. Um, as I said, there were a lot of questions, so uh, Kyle and I and the GG&A team uh, we'll take a couple of days to respond to those in writing. Um, the webinar itself and the slides will be downloadable as of tomorrow, uh, and you'll receive uh, the person who signed up for the webinar at your institutions will receive an email about that, and it's, of course, yours to send around at that point. Uh, and then in about a week, uh, look for another email from us uh, with the answers to these questions. And we're uh, very, very pleased uh, that you are all able to participate. We hope you'll continue to join us in the GGNA webinar series uh, and have a terrific rest of the week and thank you. Thank you everybody.